So why is any of this even a big deal? Because somebody hasn't died in the United States of measles in 15 years. It was eradicated in the year 2000. Now we're in 2025 and it's back. And each year, it, increasingly, people are not getting children vaccinated. So this is how epidemics start again. And it's unnecessary, I think, is what I would really say. Like, it's unnecessary to die from measles when there's a vaccine. You get your two doses and you're covered for life. You might want to get a booster at some point in your adult life, but we have this fantastic vaccine. That's why it's a big deal. It's a child's life. It's really devastating that this child died from measles because the parent didn't want to get them vaccinated for what reason we don't know. Probably fear, as I'm going to talk about a lot of this, is fear-based emotional concerns. It's tragic that this child died of measles when measles is preventable. So as of today, one child has now died from measles. This is not a video on something fearful and horrible that I'm just going to throw out there at everybody. It's really about the usual education. And my curiosity is why, what do you think? Why is it that people are so increasingly hesitant and defiant in providing vaccines for their children and themselves to the point of risking death or hospitalization? Because one in five people who get measles right now are hospitalized. One in 20 develop pneumonia. In the year 2000, there wasn't uh, measles anymore in the United States, but slowly things have continued to um, progress into having pockets in the United States in areas where we have unvaccinated people. Um, it's highly contagious, it's spreading, and now we have one death. There will probably be more. Before the vaccine, two to three people per every thousand died. So measles is not just a bad rash. Um, and that's probably one of the things that I think is most important about this vaccine hesitancy of all the things that creates this in people where they're, they're just steadfast and no matter what information, facts, details, proof is given to them, they will still say no to this topic of providing vaccines for themselves or children, no matter what is presented to them even at the risk of spreading it to others, even at the risk of hospitalization, death, they're still going to say no, no matter what is presented or shown to them. Why is that? Here are some cognitive dissonance, confirmation bias, mistrust of authorities, big one, social influence and group think, really big one. What does that even mean anyway? It means misinformation might be out there, but you're going to hang on to what the online communication is telling you rather than a pediatrician or a researcher, doctor or nurse. Fear of loss of autonomy. I think that's a big one too. What does that really mean? That um, those that are promoting vaccines to people those folks want the autonomy. They want to be able to have that choice to say no. No matter what you say to me, I have the freedom to say no. It's about personal freedom and autonomy for them. Here's another, emotional reactions over rational thinking. What's going on with that one? Let's talk about that. Fear and emotions often take precedence over reason and logic when making decisions. Why does this happen? Well, some individuals may have had negative past experiences with healthcare, haven't we all? Or vaccines, that can happen. I've had that myself. Or they may be influenced by emotionally charged narratives, such as stories of adverse vaccine reactions. These Stories that they hear about or read about in their neighborhood church friends online create such emotions in them that it overpowers any logical understanding about the risks versus benefits. Anecdotal evidence over scientific data. I think that's a really big one too. So again, weighing it more heavily on the personal stories that someone might hear about over the scientific data that is presented to them. Proof, facts, data, information. It doesn't matter for all the reasons I just listed, one more than the other is 
weighing heavily, more heavily than say the scientific data or the logic that might be presented to them. Misinformation or disinformation, what's really the difference? And that's a big one too. Misinformation specifically, it refers to the incorrect or, or misleading information shared unintentionally. Oh, that's just misinformation. It wasn't meant, it, it was shared unintentionally, it was explained in the wrong way. But disinformation is a deliberate, false or manipulated bit of information that people are passing along. I see disinformation a lot online. Social media is full of it. I'm purposely going to say that pomegranate seeds, I say pomegranate seeds cure breast cancer. And this is my friend's friend who's, you know, done this. And that person got cured. So that's just complete false disinformation. Political or ideological factors, religious factors. It doesn't say anywhere in the Bible you can't get vaccines. But there are beliefs that say, for example, if you pray harder, live better, build up your immunity, uh, other things that have to do with God will take care of you sometimes comes into play for those folks. All right, perception of risk is probably one of the things that I've seen most. So let's talk about that one a little bit. What does perception of risk mean? It is when people often have a skewed perception of risk influenced by emotions rather than statistics or probability. So some people may perceive, for example, the flu or other vaccine related disease vaccine-related preventable disease as less dangerous than they really are. This is based on disinformation, experience, media coverage, uh, just a variety of things. So it goes back to presenting with facts, statistics, examples, showing, proving, drawing it out, explaining the safety of vaccines versus the risk of not getting vaccinated. And no matter what is said, that person's perception of risk, no matter what is presented to them, is extraordinarily higher than the reality of the chance of getting, dying, or being hospitalized from the illness. That that risk factor that they perceive to be so high is enough for them to risk death. Why do people risk possible death? Why would somebody who loves their child or children purposely not vaccinate them, knowing that there's a risk of illness and death? So a lot of this reason is from cognitive dissonance. And there are so many wonderful examples of this. I'm not a therapist. I'm not an expert in this. I just wanted to talk with you about some of these things. What I can say is I personally have seen people who do you use seeds and nuts in prayer for cancer? I do see people who have had children hospitalized for whooping cough, for example, seeing that their child is gravely ill and can't breathe or has influenza, but is still not, not under any circumstances ever going to vaccinate them, risking that they could have another illness or they could die during this hospitalization. That's how gravely ill they are. But the parent still is saying, I'm not going to do it based on a lot of these reasons that I just gave. But when we talk about cognitive dissonance, we hear about it these days a lot because um, Scientology is a really big hot button, right? So a lot of people talk about cognitive dissonance re related to Scientology and related to cults because um, it's, it's really this, this belief in something that goes against your integrity, you're, you're, you're split. You've got, you know, for example, that this cult leader is doing really harmful things to people. You've seen it with your own eyes. You see that that person's abusing people or giving out false information that makes no sense. But on the other hand, you, you believe in that person. You're supposed to believe in them. You're going to look like a fool if you don't believe in them because this is something you've been living and dying for all this, these years. So you've got this, this integrity issue going on that's feeling really uncomfortable. You've got one foot here and one foot here, and you're uncomfortable. You don't like this. You've got to figure out a way to resolve one of them. So how are you going to resolve one of them? Do I risk my child being ill when I, when I, I believe in, I believe in medicine, but I don't believe in vaccines. But on the other hand, I want my child to be safe. And I don't know that I want to fully risk 
a possibility of a critical illness or death. I don't know what to do. My mind is saying one thing. My beliefs are saying another. My integrity is split. So what do you do when one foot is um, in one boat and one foot is in the other, as a lot of therapists like to say about cognitive dissonance? So what I've learned about it a little bit is that the person has to either change the behavior, change the way of thinking, or justify. Just and that's a really common one. Justification. Well, you know, I'm part of the church group that says no to this, so uh, they must know better than me, even though it kind of goes against what I think and believe. But you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go with it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that foot off over here, and I'm gonna go with it because that's what I've been believing, and that's what people are telling me. And so I'm gonna justify that they must know better than everybody else that has looked at this even though my feelings, uh, it's, it's just causing me such distress, I'm going to hop over here. So really changing behavior and changing thinking. I mean, again, I'm just, I'm just talking about this with you. Uh, you know, that, that just might mean I'm going to really research this myself. I've got to come to some resolution that's comfortable for me that I can live with myself over, over this decision. And so I'm going to do some research. I'm going to think about pros and cons. I'm going to talk to my doctor. I'm sticking with the whole thing about vaccines. I'm going to talk to my pediatrician. Are my fears and my beliefs true? If they are true that vaccines are more evil than getting the actual illness, then I'm going to talk to my pediatrician about it so things line up better for me and I can finally hop on one or the other. But I firmly believe after all the years of working pediatrics that parents are going to do what they want to do. Excuse me. That um, I've watched parents be presented with facts and scientific research and begging and pleading for the sake of their child and they still will not do it. Now, with this child that just died in Texas from measles, when it's uh, preventable, should a parent be responsible for this? Because right now, parents get to say over their children, maybe that child would have been able to grow up and say, you know, I really wish you, I wanted to be vaccinated. I, I would have loved to have been vaccinated. I didn't get that choice, so, so I died. I didn't get that choice, so I was hospitalized. Now, I'm not saying that vaccines are foolproof. I already in another uh, video talked to you about what happened to me when I had a vaccine. You know, I do believe there are circumstances, of course there are, where things don't turn out perfectly right. Or people talk about severe vaccine injured children. I'm not saying or, or uh, not listening to those fears too, but we're back to what the risk and benefit ratio is. And which one are you willing to take for the sake of your child? As of tonight, right now this evening, about 5.30 p.m., I was hearing that RFK Jr. announced that two children had died from measles in Texas, but I'm still only seeing one. Um, anybody got information on that? He also said that other children were in the hospital, not for measles necessarily, but they're being quarantined. I don't know that that's accurate either. As of this evening, um, Anyway, just wanted to add a little bit of that.